Good morning, Calvary. How's everyone this morning? All right, you all know you can talk. Come on now. All right, come on now. How many people in here know that Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to you? Come on now. I know I do. I'm thankful to God for this moment right now. I'm thankful for every opportunity that he allows me to show up clothed in his amazing grace for me. Sometimes, with most times I should say, with fear and trembling, but I show up and I'm thankful to God. I thank God for Pastor Andrews and Sister Andrews. Well, I was going to say we pray for a speedy recovery, but that train has left the building. So we pray for a full recovery and we look forward to you being back in the place. You know, I thank God for the leadership of, in this particular church here, because you know we have the Bloomington campus. And I thank God for all of you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you, God, for this day. I thank you for all that you're doing, Father. I thank you, God, that you alone get the glory, Father. God, that you allow me to say it as you gave it to me, and that you allow them to hear it as I heard it coming from you, Father. You anoint us, God, in Jesus' name to receive, God, that we may be transformed, God. And I thank you for all that you're doing, God. All you get all the glory, all the honor and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. As um, Brandon said, uh, we are continuing our um, series, Undercover. My particular topic for this uh, Sunday is double honor. Now, 1 Timothy 5 and 18 says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward that somehow there is a mutual relationship between these two characters or creatures, it took me on a journey that was fascinating and humbling as God began to open my eyes. Now this letter, 1 Timothy, was written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy, who was now the pastor of the church in Ephesus, charging him again to remain faithful to what he had been taught. The truth of the gospel, Paul said, guard it. The central purpose of 1 Timothy is found in verse 15, chapter 3. Paul says, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God and the pillar and ground of truth. It says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Now, this word honor is not unfamiliar to us. Even before we became Christians, we had some concept of what that meant, what it looked like. There are designated holidays designed to help us honor people. Mother's Day, Father's Day, Memorial Day, just to name a few. We buy chocolate, send flowers sing songs, write poems. Men and women who make advancements in science and medicine, industry and technology, they're honored with awards or streets named after them. In some situations where custom or propriety forbids a price to be set, an honorarium is given, a gift if you will. It went beyond merely words of gratitude, but a financial support to say thank you. And rightly so, there's nothing wrong with that. So we are not uninformed on this topic of honor. Showing honor to someone is certainly not lost in God's word. In fact, Romans 13 and 7 tells us, give to everyone what you owe. Do you owe taxes? Then pay it. Do you owe anything else to the government? Then pay it. Do you owe 
respect, give it. Do you owe honor? Then show it. I like the fact that this translation asks the question, not because, I mean, excuse me, it reminds me of when God asked Adam, where are you? Not because God didn't know where Adam was, but to engage Adam in thought. So I ask this question of all of us. Do we owe honor? Now that was my introduction. As I said, my topic is double honor. But now I'm going to take you on the scenic route. I'm going to take you on the journey that God took me on. And this is the scenic route. But hopefully I'll get to my destination and you'll all understand what this was all about. <laughs> all right. So let's go. Now. We started out this year, God speaking through pastor, that it was time to rebuild, that God was rebuilding our foundation. The first one, um, yeah, the, the first um, foundation had been breached and we needed to rebuild it. So we embarked on a six part series addressing various aspects of fundamental principles, those things that needed to be in place for our foundation to be sound. Because what God is going to do, we need to be able to hold it. We first talked about unity, being of one mind, on one accord, being absent of diversity of purpose. We were united on that purpose. From there, God instructed us to repair our personal altars and get back to spending time with him, making God our priority. God's word being the manuscript by which we lived and moved, holiness and worship. All these things bind, cement, and steady the foundation. Over the summer, we dealt with the spirit of Jezebel, what it is how it operates and ensnares in the church, that its purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If that spirit can't cut off the head, the leadership, it divides and conquers the members, but its ultimate goal is to dismantle the church. We learned don't tolerate it, put it out, keep it out. So now, here we are, under cover. And God is, according to the letter Paul wrote to Timothy, teaching us how to conduct ourselves in the house of God. Let's deal with this ox, this metaphor. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox. An ox is what we call a beast of burden, an animal employed to carry heavy loads, or to perform other heavy work, such as pulling a plow. This was the analogy given in reference to treatment of elders who were worthy of double honor, who labored in word and doctrine. Don't get confused by the title elder. It's simply another name for minister or pastor, a senior member. But this metaphor that if an ox wears a muzzle during the process of tramping the grain on the threshing floor that it cannot partake of the fruit of its own labor. Shouldn't the ox be able to eat while laboring for that which will feed you? The point being is the little that the ox may eat, is it to be compared to the laboring beast or it's laboring what it's laboring produces, which is the greater value. Threshing is a process of separating the husk from the corn. Husk are the part of the corn that cannot be eaten, so the threshing separates it from the corn, which is then the corn taken and ground into flour, which then is made into a multitude of things that feeds and nourishes us. The pastor or elder is not unlike this beast of burden. 
Now, doctrine, it said, who labor in word and doctrine. Now, the doctrine, we know that to mean the gospel of Jesus Christ, the inerrant word of God, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. That is the doctrine. Nothing added, nothing taken away. Keeping it free of heresy. Paul told Timothy to remain faithful to it, to guard it. Now, the word in this passage, when I looked it up, this means speech, to speak intelligently. Also, reason manifesting itself in the power of speech. Simply put, teach. To teach, to impart knowledge of or skill through the spoken word. Every time we walk into the sanctuary, it's like coming to the threshing floor the place of separation and revelation. The pastor being yoked to God, the threshing begins. Jeremiah 3.15 says, and I will give you pastors according to mine own heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, I'm not a farm girl. Anybody that know me know, I don't even like dogs or cats, so we ain't gonna worry about all the other stuff. Okay, but now this analogy of a bull plow, pulling a plow. The purpose of the plowing is to give those seeds the best chance of germinating and growing. The large blades of a plow break up the earth, cutting and turning it so it's loose and ready to be planted with seeds. So in the same sense, the pastor begins to trample by engaging the intellect, skillfully using words to impart the doctrine, or as we say, he preaching and teaching, holding fast the truth of the gospel and teaching it in such a way that we become equipped. Soul and spirit is divided. Joints separate from marrow. The thoughts and intents of the heart are detected. As the separation occurs, revelation comes. We submit ourselves to this revealing, becoming doers and not hearers only. Just like that corn is refined and then used for multiple purposes, we also are changed and God uses us to serve for his purpose. The purpose of the gospel is not just to inform us, but to transform us. We become more like Christ. What pastors do is without a doubt labor. All we see is when they stand here. But in order for this to be right, he had to get it right on the dark side, the part that you don't see. Hebrews 13 and 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that, that ain't good for you to get them trouble. God already got them yoked, and now you want to come in here with your stuff. Come on now. <laughs> and for that, Paul says, double honor. He says, this is how you conduct yourself in God's house. Now, I want to read a few scriptures from 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 14, so that we see it from God's word. Now, this is Paul speaking. He makes it real plain what it means not to muzzle the ox. Now, you know how Paul is. He says it, and you deal with it. Okay. So let's read. For it is written... In the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. It is oxen God is concerned. He said, is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, 
is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, you know, the government, they don't get theirs. You know, the government don't even ask your name. They don't care that your auntie died and y'all trying to get the money together for a funeral. They don't care nothing about that. They take their money right off the bat. They don't even ask. But Paul is saying, if others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this gift, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel. He said, we have not taken advantage of the fact that we can ask for it. Because we don't want the gospel to be hindered. Because you know, somebody asked y'all for a dollar, now you think, you know, your little dollar going to buy a car. Stop. Stop. He said, but endure all things. I'm sorry, go back to that. Did I finish that one? But endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Next one. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live by it. Hallelujah. He said, so you see, what Paul says, when Paul says they are worthy of double honor, it's not just words of respect and patting the pastor on the back and saying, great job. But it is reaching in your pocket and, as they say, putting your money where your mouth is. You say great job, then show it through your financial support. So I ask, do we owe honor? Do we owe honor? double honor. There are three things that I would like to emphasize here as I continue to go. The first thing, all authority comes from God. This was mentioned before, but it is worth emphasizing again and again and again times infinity. All authority comes from God. He is as aware of the little boy or girl that was voted hall monitor as he is aware of who was voted president of the United States. Lamentations 3 and 37 says, who can command a thing to happen without the Lord's permission? Nothing gets by him. He knows exactly where you are, who shepherds the house you're in, and what everybody is doing in the house. If you are there, it's because he called it that way. All authority comes from God. To rebel against authority is to rebel against God. Jesus says in John 13, was that 13 and 17? Jesus says in John 13, 17, we'll leave it at that till I can correct it. I believe that's it. Speaking to his disciples, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. To honor authority is to honor God. So no more of this, well, I don't like him, but I love Jesus. Eh. Come on now. Come on. Point two. The necessity of obedience and submission so that God can lead and guide us and thereby we become sons. They that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. It's only through our obedience and submission we are changed. I was asked, explain that. How do you mean we are changed? You got to trust the process. The change that occurs is God's doing. You don't know when it happens. But if you submit to what he's telling us to do, you know you're part of a local body, and the local body says that every Wednesday is Bible study, or every Sunday morning at 1.30 we got prayer before service. You submit to all that. You submit to it, and you show up, whether you understand it or not. And in the process of you doing, transformation is taking place. 
You may not see it or know it or none of it, but you submit yourself to what God is asking. When he told, oh, who's that, Abraham, he said, get your son, get you and your son up and go. And mother said, where am I going? He said, you'll know it when you see it. We walk by faith. It's the process, and you have to trust the process. It says, by trust, it says, James 4 and 10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Obedience is a protection against rebellion. Because if you're doing what you're supposed to, rebellion ain't got a foot, you ain't got a foot to go. It's a protection. You don't have to worry about rebellion if you do what you say, if you do what you're told. Do it. Obeying and submitting to authority is God setting you up for a blessing. Ask the widow at Zarephath when the prophet Elijah showed up at her door. Now, I don't know. I've heard some things about prophets that, you know, they, you know, they're real demanding, but I don't know. But he did tell her, feed me first and then feed you and the boy. She submitted to that. She obeyed. And you know the story? They ate for a long time. Her and her whole house. And this was during a period of famine. The whole place, the whole country was being decimated by famine. But she, her son, and her household ate because she obeyed the prophet. She submitted to that. Also, submission and obedience is God involving us in what he is doing on the earth. I was asked that again. How does that, how, how is God involved in us? And I had to think about it, and my answer is what I just said. You got to trust the process. The only example I can give of that is my own testimony. When I first came to Calvary, I was just so happy to be saved. My life was so ratchet, to, you know, and God saved me and cleaned me up, and I was happy to clean the bathrooms. You hear me? I was happy to do it, and I did it well. My mentality was if anyone comes to Calvary, if they don't say nothing about nothing else, they're going to say how clean the bathrooms were. I was just happy to clean the bathrooms. I was happy to do it. And in the process of that, just doing what I was asked, going to, you know, it's being in the atmosphere. It's being around people who are talking about God, like-minded people. It's about sharing testimonies and all of that. It's, it's submitting yourself to that process of doing and all of that. But even then with that, when I was cleaning the bathrooms, I kid you not, I didn't see this. I actually told a pastor after I finished Purpose Institute, I don't think God's leading me to do that, to be a teaching pastor. He was like, okay. <laughs> He's like, okay. And then he comes back and he says, ah, you know, maybe the week or two after that, he says, ah, Lenore, Tisha, I think you ought to think about that. And I'm like, oh, no, I think God said, no, that's not where I'm going. <laughs> and then the next thing I know, uh, we want you to do a devotion on Saturday. I'm like, huh? But it's the processing. It's the process. It's being in the environment. The transformation, I think I was uh, Pastor Lee Stone King. He said when the rapture occurs, it'll be like, you know, you in the process of walking and you put one foot down and you pick up the next and we gone. And that's the way the transformation is. You just walking. You're just doing what you do every day. You're just coming to church and serving and and fellowshipping and all of that. And before you know it, you look up and you think, dang, look at me. I know I don't like that neighbor, but here I am with my hand up waving at her. Hey, how's it going? And you know you didn't like her before, but you don't remember when you start liking her. You don't know. That's what God does. It's, 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 it's transformational. That's what he does. We become active participants when we submit and obey. Through our obedience, we experience God's love. It's how we demonstrate faith. It says to God, he's first in our lives. Obedience is an act of worship. And specifically for today's message, it is how we show double honor for those who labor in word and deed. And you say, where's the double? Well, you should be respecting the office. You should be respecting the office, the position that they hold. And the double honor is that word and doctrine, they, the Bible commands that they should live off this gospel. So we show it by financial support. My third point, 
financial support. To support ministers of the gospel is commanded by God. It was always God's plan for those who labored in the gospel to be supported by it. The 10th chapter of Matthew, Jesus sends out the 12 disciples. Verse 10, Jesus tells them to take nothing with you. He told them, don't take anything with you. And he tells them, for the workman is worthy of his meat. In Luke 10, 7 and 8, again, Jesus sends out the 70. And he tells them the same thing. Take nothing. Luke's translation says, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Read Leviticus or Deuteronomy where God says the temple workers are to be fed from the temple for their service. Romans 10 and 15 says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Is this not worthy of double honor or more specifically financial support? The servant of God who labors to cultivate in you something that has eternal value? Rebellion is insidious. You can't be rebellious about one thing. It will find something else to come up against. It spreads. And you might be thinking, what has that got to do with financial support? Well, if God commanded it and you ain't doing it, then that one little drop will spread like mold until it reaches the foundation. So you see, obedience and submission, because that's what God commands, and the financial care and love of his laborers is good for everyone involved. This is what double honor looks like. Obedience, submission, financial support. Do not muzzle the ox while he threads out the corn. Now, before I turn over the mic, I just want to say, do you see how God is getting us ready for what he is about to do? And now God has us undercover, teaching us by his spirit how to align ourselves through obedience and submission to authority, and that this is right conduct in his house to honor his authority. God has purposed Calvary for a mighty move of his power. Now, I'm no builder or architect, but I do know that when a foundation is laid or rebuilt, it's because someone intends on placing something on top of it. Now, since it's God that's rebuilding the foundation, I'm thinking he may just want to set his glory. And we need to be able to hold it. Let's, let's be on one accord. Let's be united. Let's go back to the first year. Keep those altars rebuilt. Spending our personal time in word and fellowshipping and doing all those things that we know to do. All of those things. Because God has a plan for Calvary. He has a plan for us. We need to be able to hold his glory. So in conclusion, I ask, if there is anyone, if there's anyone here, and you know who you are, if you've gotten maybe relaxed in what you do here in the house of God, maybe in your personal life, you know, maybe you've, you know, kind of even slid from the beginning of the year and praying and, and reading and, and just, you know, the things that you know to do concerning spiritual. We all know to get up and go to work and clean our house and all those things like that. But when, the, when, the, when this earth burns, you're going to wish you had done something else. You're going to wish you had done something else. You, you're going you're gonna to sit, you're going to be there thinking as that fire is coming up on you. Doggone it, I could have let them dishes go. I should have went to church that night. But you got an opportunity right now. You got an opportunity right now. Maybe you're not giving God the best of your energy. 
not coming out for Sunday morning prayer at 1.30 right before service. Yeah, I said that loud, intentionally. <laughs> but uh, maybe you feel like it's no big deal, you know, to be in every service. But it is a big deal. It's a big deal. It's about the transformation of you. But every, every service you miss, every fellowship you miss, you're missing an opportunity. This is what's happening. Every time you come to church, God is changing. I take that back. I want to say it slow. It's God. It's spiritual that you don't know is happening, but it's happening. Do not neglect the things of God. If you feel you need to have that conversation with God, don't leave this house. Get up here to the altar. Have that conversation with God so that when you go back, you can kick everything out that's, the, that's opposite of God out your house. You can open your doors and talk like they used to do in the, you know, back in the day. They open the doors and the windows and start talking and throwing everything out the window. Yeah, not literally. You also don't go throw nothing literally out your window. We, we mean spiritually. Open your windows and kick everything out that opposes God in your life. that you need to confess some things to God, please come to the altar. Have that conversation.